Did you return your papers? Exam papers? Already? All right. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. One of your friends asked a question. Well, uh, Arab, could you please reiterate that question so that everybody hears? I was just wondering how IAEA uh, is working. I mean, do they act, act on based on assumptions or accusations? All right, so how do they start carrying out inspections? As I said here, every non-nuclear weapon state party to the MPT, that is a country which promised not to develop nuclear weapons, signed and ratified the treaty, must conclude a safeguards agreement. Safeguard agreement must sign a safeguards agreement with the IAEA within, I guess, six months after the ratification and this safeguards agreement will be signed according to the model protocol because the model protocol in its 114 uh, paragraphs describes the, the method and the procedure that will be applied by the IAEA in carrying out inspections. So after signing the MPT as a non-nuclear weapon state and ratifying it within six months, Every country, every non-nuclear weapon state must conclude a safeguards agreement based on the model protocol of 1970, which, as I explained in the first hour, relatively weaker document. And according to this document, the IAEA and the country will agree upon the methods and the procedures as to how to carry out inspections. And after that safeguards agreement is signed, at a given time, the IAEA will notify the country uh, whichever it's going to carry out inspections about its <coughs> forthcoming visit. Actually, in the model protocol, there was room for challenge inspections. Normally, inspections are carried out according to a schedule, and the IAEA and the state authorities sit and decide on the dates of successive visits of the IAEA during which these inspections will be carried out. And normally, a nuclear facility will be inspected maybe every year or every other year, depending on its scale, depending on the significance of the material that may be there, because you do not go and visit the same facility every year if there is nothing going on, or there is not, uh, it is not likely for anything to go on in the future. So it depends on the assessment of the IAEA technical body, and they, they fix a schedule as to how frequently these facilities that will be declared to the IAEA will have to be visited and inspection should be carried out. So um, once these inspections are carried out, if everything is fine, if IAEA does not find anything suspicious about the amount of the nuclear material that are used during the operations or about any other activity, they say, all right, I went to this particular facility, I carried out inspections according to the model protocols procedures, and I have not found anything suspicious, so I can say that there is nothing going on. I can verify that things are going according to schedule or according uh, to the declared intentions of the states. There is also, as I said, this challenge inspection. A challenge inspection is an inspection which will not be notified to the state authorities, and the IAEA, of course, will, on a very short notice, for instance, the, today is Tuesday, and they send a cable, they send a message or whatever, call someone, or send a telegram or something, and, and, and notify the state authorities that on Thursday, a team will come and visit such and such facility to carry, carry out inspections. There may be some problems, because every single IAEA inspector will need a visa, most probably, to enter that country. And if there's any problem with visa, sort of issuance of visa, this challenge inspection may be postponed. Or they may not go to that country because of some other conditions. Or they may say, well, we cannot open our facility to, to, to your inspections because of such and such operation going on. Of course, challenge inspection 
can be asked by the Inter International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors only if there is a good reason for suspicion about some activities going on. So either after a routine inspection or after a challenge inspection, the task of the IAEA is to report to the board if there is anything suspicious or if everything is going on according to the declared intentions of the state. If there is anything suspicious, the IAEA Board of Governors will notify the state and will ask for further clarifications about the points that the IAEA inspectors on the ground were not satisfied. Either they may not be given um, escort to visit some place, or they may not be presented enough material, or they may not have enough explanation about some missing material. So the IA inspectors will say, all right, we went there, but we were not satisfied, so we cannot verify that they are doing everything fine. So the board will ask for clarification. And if the board, uh, or if the state provides that necessary information which was missing during the uh, inspections, then the board might be satisfied. But if the board is not satisfied, even after the clarifications of the state, or no clarification at all, the only thing the board can do is to take the issue to the United Nations Security Council. Because the board, the IAEA, does not have its police force, does not have any enforcement capa capability. So uh, the, the, the only thing the IAEA can do is to sort of uh, transfer the file, the dossier of that country, to the UN Security Council. And the United Nations Security Council will, of course, deal with the problem. So uh, of course. Can the IAEA rely on in intelligence? According to model protocol, the International Atomic Energy Agency cannot rely on intelligence. The IAEA does not have its own intelligence either. So the whole issue was, of course, depending on the information that will be supplied by the state. So if the state supply enough and, and satisfactory information and allows inspections without any hindrance or without any obstacles, provocations, then the IAEA can go there and carry out inspections. If there's nothing wrong, go back home to Vienna headquarters, write the report and says, there is this clean bill of health. There is nothing wrong with that country. So therefore, but if anything suspicious going on, as I said, or if they hear uh, they get some uh, intelligence from various sources. Of course, according to additional protocol, they can rely on this intelligence. But Hans Blix was here a couple of weeks ago, and he was the, uh, uh, the of course, previous uh, uh, former director of the IAEA before Mohamed El Baradei, and even before uh, Rolf Ekeus. And uh, of course, he was the director of uh, General of Anmovic, and he said, actually, during his term as the head of ANMOVIC, they were provided with hundreds of intelligence reports from dozens of intelligence uh, sort of uh, organizations. And he said, and I remember him saying that back in 2003 uh, at the United Nations Security Council when, when he was presenting his report, um, he said, what we need is not lots of information, lots of intelligence. We need is reliable intelligence. So, of course, many states might provide intelligence, just as the ones that you see at the WikiLeaks, and many of which are baseless, are just rumors, are not substantiated with facts, figures, data, ver verifiable, verifiable sort of a tangible information. But therefore, uh, this in intelligence might fool the minds of these people. So. What they need is correct information, reliable information, timely information, or intelligence about something that might be really going wrong. And the IAEA, of course, depending on what kind of protocol is applied to that particular state, may visit that country. And if finds something wrong, of course, it will write in its report. So the IAEA is prompted by, of course, uh, first of all, the, the procedures, um, the, the uh, sort of terms of the model protocol, they are given the right to ask for inspections, for challenge inspections, or to go to that country as part of the routine inspection schedule. And if they hear something, they may, of course, use 
uh, this bilateral sort of um, uh, connections with people. For instance, the Director General, as I said, in 2002, when there was this uh, revelations coming from the Iranian opposition group, he went to Tehran, asked for clarifications about Natan's facility, which was not declared to the IAEA, and he was most possibly not satisfied because I was one of the uh, scholars uh, who were invited to, to the uh, IAEA headquarters back in 2003, uh, in early 2003, February, if I'm not mistaken. And El Barade just came directly from Tehran, and he did not even go to his office and came to the meeting room. Uh, you, you might have seen this big hall, uh, the, the, this, the plenary uh, room of the, um, the IAEA. And one of the first things he said, I remember, uh, that Iran will have serious headaches about these allegations. And a couple of months, or a couple of, yeah, a couple of months later, and that was not public yet. I was among these scholars who were informed uh, by the, uh, Mohammed al Baradei about this situation, but of course we were not allowed to disclose uh, uh, this information to other people, but several months, oh, a couple of months later, he made this public statement and asked from the IAEA to sign the additional, additional protocol. And as I mentioned, uh, the deadline was December 31st, and in early two, November uh, 2003, with the initiative taken by the uh, European Tree, um, uh, the uh, Iranian authorities signed, but still not ratified the additional protocol, according to which, uh, from November 2003, all throughout 2004, and the early 2005, uh, until Ahmadinejad <coughs> came to power with the June 2005 election. And a few months before that, uh, European uh, Union three, French, British and German sort of uh, uh, foreign ministers, and Iran cooperated as if additional protocol was enforced. But as I explained, when it came to carrying out inspections in Parchin metro base, uh, there was a deadlock. So this is, uh, again, something about uh, how difficult this situation is. Because after all, on the one hand, Iran has its uh, sovereign rights to carry out, uh, carry out all the uh, research and building facilities. Because according to Article uh, 4 of MPT, states who promise not to develop uh, nuclear weapons or not to divert their peaceful nuclear capabilities to military capabilities are allowed to develop indigenously by themselves or by way of transfers with cooperation with other countries, they can develop nuclear facilities for peaceful uses. And enrichment as well as reprocessing are, or such facilities that can be used for peaceful purposes as well as military purposes. So random enrichment, enrichment and reprocessing are actually uh, have two faces. They can be used for military and peaceful, military and peaceful purposes. I mean, if you enrich uh, somewhere between 3.5 to 8 percent, it can be used in low enrich uranium light water reactors. Or if you enrich up to 20 percent, you can use in research reactors. If you enrich up to 60 or even 80 percent, you can use in submarines or aircraft carriers. Because instead of uh, carrying tons of, uh, uh, thousands of uh, uh, gallons of uh, gasoline, if you have a, a nuclear reactor for sort of um, powering uh, the the, the submarine or the aircraft carrier, then it is, of course, no military use. I mean, the fact that submarines might be, or aircraft carriers might be military assets, this does not mean that the use of uh, 60 or 80 percent enriched uranium in submarines does not necessarily mean a military purpose. 
Because when we say military purpose, we talk about the weapons purposes. And submarines fueled by a nuclear reactor or for electricity generation, for cleaning the air, for desalinating the water, just to stay under the water for a long time, this is still within the context of peaceful use. Of course, if a country has this much and rich or even higher levels of air, because in some submarines you have either uh, 90 plus air rich uranium, so a percent, 90 plus percent air rich uranium. So still maybe within the formal, formally within the context of peaceful use, but this much air rich uranium is always something that can be easily diverted from peaceful to major purpose. So therefore this is something, uh, I mean enrichment is, is a way which, may, which might go all the way, of course 90 plus percent is weapons. So you see from very peaceful uses in light water reactors, I mean power reactors just generate electricity, etc. Or research reactors 20 percent, 50, 60 or even 80 percent in nuclear submarines or aircraft carriers, still peaceful. But when it comes to 90 plus percent and if the intention is to use in weapons warheads, then or as an atomic bomb, then it is military. Same applies to this, reprocessing. As I, I try to explain here, and I'm not going to go into the technical details, not to bore some, some of you, but reprocessing is the extraction of plutonium. Actually, it is 238 isotope, which captures a neutron, turns out to be plutonium, two, uh, actually U239, which is plutonium. And this plutonium, after some time, which is in the waste, you sort of take the waste, waste and put uh, immerse in deep water for cooling down. It takes about a year, a year and a half. And after that, you take it out and you extract the plutonium, which is inside the waste. And this plutonium can either be used in nuclear warheads directly, or can be used again for peaceful purposes in nuclear reactors. And as, as I said before, I mean, in past previous weeks, many, if not all, of the Japanese nuclear reactors are fueled by plutonium. And this is a real concern in some parts. Of course, just like we have seen in the WikiLeaks documents, people do not say this aloud in front of public, and they do not express their concerns about the stocks of plutonium that Japan has, which, according to some estimates might be enough to produce around 3,000, 5,000 nuclear warheads. But still, the same plutonium can be used for purely peaceful purposes in more than 50 nuclear reactors of Japan. But concerns are, what if Japan one day changes its mind and decides to go nuclear, to, to develop nuclear weapons? They will have enough plutonium stocked and they even you know, built a very large uh, plutonium processing facility in Rokoshimura. And until such time, they were sending the fuel, uh, the waste coming out of their nuclear reactors to France and Germany, and they were getting back in terms of plutonium. So this, this plutonium stocks has, uh, has, have always been a very uh, sensible issue. But of course, Japan is not a rogue state. Japan is a democratic state. Japan is a state which is quite aware of the very negative consequences of developing nuclear weapons by itself, broke, um, uh, breaching its international obligations, not complying with the inspections, etc. It is very unlikely that Japan might develop nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future. But if the whole international system changes, and sometimes, I mean, unlike the past, now the, the frequency of uh, groundbreaking events, groundbreaking developments is actually much smaller. I mean, in the past, maybe every 30 years, every 25 years, some important things were happening. Now, almost every 5, 10 years, things are happening. So what if, say, from 10, 15 years from today, some uh, unusual developments take place, some extraordinary developments takes place, and and then 
Japan under the psyche of these developments, for instance, North Korea and South Korea reuniting and keeping their nuclear weapons capability, Japan then may decide to go nuclear. This is something that was told to me by a Japanese ambassador. So therefore, and it was, I mean, he did not ask me not to say this anyway. So this is not something uh, actually uh, private. And this is something that many people in the field know very well. So therefore, uh, uh, these two technologies, capabilities, are significant both for military as well as peaceful purposes. It is important to bear this in mind and when a country develops a nuclear uh, enrichment capability or reprocessing, reprocessing capability, of course you look at the capabilities and the intentions. Remember, threat is a combination of capabilities and intentions, whichever, of course, uh, should be uh, given more or assigned priority depends on the country that you're talking about and the context. For some countries, you may have to pay more attention to the developments in the capability because it might be a very stable country and it might be very unlikely for the intentions of that country to change. For instance, Nordic countries, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, the Belgium, Germany, well, Germany is still being uh, doubted by some anyway, but it is, I mean, you do not doubt their intentions because, for instance, Sweden, back in the 50s, discussed this issue in the parliament. After long discussions, they have decided to put in the constitution a restriction for the forthcoming governments that would prevent them from developing nuclear weapons. So it is by constitution unlawful for any government in Sweden to embark on a nuclear weapons program. It would be anti-constitutional if a Swedish government did something to, to build nuclear weapons. So therefore, you might be much more confident about the peaceful intentions of Swedish government, for instance. But what about Iran? Or what about other countries uh, in the world that, are, that have been and still are at the focus, such as North Korea? So therefore, depending on the context, depending on the uh, nature of, of, of or, or the regime or the administrative uh, style or making politics, because some countries uh, are more true to their words. I mean, they act the way they speak. And what we have seen again from these WikiLeaks that Turkey's sort of uh, statements before the public and behind the doors are very similar. And as I said many times, not only here but also to foreign diplomats or in the conferences, we do not know how to make tricks. So really, I mean, I don't know whether this is a plus or minus, but it is not in our culture to be very, uh, to carry out tricky politics. We do not know how to do it. So we will definitely fail even if we try to do something like that. But some countries are very professional. I will not name here anyone, but you can guess. <laughs> so therefore, it is, it is very uh, important to look at some countries' capabilities. Whatever they say about their true intentions, you may not believe, or you should not even believe at all. So therefore, if there's any increase in the capabilities, whatever they say with respect to their intentions that they do not do anything wrong, you should pay attention to the capabilities, right? So therefore, in order to make an assessment about the uh, dimension of the threats. So therefore, it is uh, something very uh, difficult to assess. In the past, before France developed its nuclear weapons, in the second half of the 1950s, because they tested their first device in 1960, and in the run-up to their first nuclear test, there were some discussions in the French parliament, in the French public, in the press, and the public, uh, in academic circles, as to whether France was developing nuclear weapons. And the French parliamentarians, ministers from the government, informed their own cabinets and all the, their own parliamentarians, and said, and always said 
and denied all the accusations that France was developing weapons. They said, no, we're not doing anything like that. All our intentions are peaceful. We are not developing nuclear weapons. At a time when there was nothing that would restrict France from developing nuclear weapons. There was no MPT, nothing. And even after MPT, there were nuclear weapons state. So there was no reason to lie, actually. But what they did was to not necessarily tell the truth, because this is a matter of national security. And especially after the Suez Canal crisis, and after the goal who saw how the United States behaved during the Suez Canal crisis, remember 1956, and that they were let down by the United States because uh, British, French, and Israeli forces attack uh, Egypt, and who intervened? It was the United States and Russia, of course, and the Soviet Union, because they did not want this issue to escalate. So after this incident, France lost its confidence in the United States, and actually, because I studied with French professors at Lycée de Galatasaray, I know the French mentality, they have to be at the forefront of everything, at the center of everything. So they said, we have to have our independent nuclear capability. And they embarked on nuclear weapons development. But at the same time, they said that they were not doing it. So, and then after they detonated their first nuclear device that everybody knew about nuclear weapons, capability of France, they said, well, at that time, we had no other option but to say what we have said. So there is no country which exactly uh, declares what it is doing in any, uh, especially in any of such issues which have um, uh, nuclear security implications. So therefore, this is something that we should also bear in mind. So when it comes to, uh, I mean, going back to this issue, the United States pursues, uh, perceives Iran as a, as a threat for its own interests, as well as for the interest of its allies, because they are not uh, necessarily uh, sort of uh, confident about the declared intention of Iran, because Iran says, we do not build nuclear weapons. This is against Islam. This is against the Quran. This is against our belief system. This is against our worldview and everything. But not many people believe in what they say. And what, when they look at their capabilities, especially over the last 10 years, there's a steady increase in terms of uh, military capabilities. I mean, the ballistic missiles, whose ranges extended from 1998, which was 1,300 kilometers, and this year, or let's say 2009 or 2010, it's approximately, not uh, exactly, 2,500 kilometers. Almost double the range of their Shahab-3 missiles in tests. Well, this is... A little bit of uh, uh, distorted information. I'm not sure if they exceeded 2,000 kilometers, but information suggests that they have exceeded. Well, I'm, I'm still dub uh, dubious. I mean, I doubt it. But yet, there is a clear indication that there is a steady increase in their military capabilities. Plus, in their peaceful capabilities, in terms of uh, Bush Air Reactor now starting operation uh, and will still be, will uh, soon be generating electricity in the coming months. And also a number of scientists, a number of uh, facilities that they have built, some of which were secret. Just this time last year, uh, the, a secret uh, uh, enrichment facility, a clandestine en enrichment facility was surfaced by the CIA. And before CIA's declaration, Iranians themselves uh, have declared to the world that there was another undeclared uh, enrichment facility of smaller scale in Qum. Uh, so the Qum facility uh, was supposed to have uh, something, a capability to host 3,500 uh, 3, up to 5,000 and, and centrifuges. And when, when compared to the Natanz facility, which could host, not for the time being, but uh, when finished fully, which can host 50, 55,000 enrichment uh, en centrifuges. The Qum facility would be significant, especially if Iran, after having enriched uranium up to 3.5%, let me just, I mean, uh, let's put this here.
I mean, this is Nathan's Its capacity is 55,000 centrifuges. And these centrifuges are rotating very fast and separating 238 and 235. And I will not go, don't worry, into details. You can just uh, Google on, uh, on the internet and find a lot of information. Or if you like, you can just read some of my papers. Uh, and the install capacity around 8,000 centrifuges, and operating capacity, roughly speaking, 5,000 centrifuges. And so far, Iran produced approximately 2,500 kilograms of 3.5% enriched, low enriched uranium. And actually, 1,200 kilograms of which was subject to the swap deal just last May. And as I mentioned previously, and I will talk more in detail. So the concern of the West is that in Natanz, which was not declared, but now that we know, there is such and such capability. And out of the installed centrifuges, they operate approximately on the average some 5,000 of them, 6,000 sometimes, 4,000 some other times. And so far, they have uh, produced two, uh, 2,600 kilograms of low energy uranium, which can be used only in power reactors, such as the one in Boucher. But why do they produce this much? Because the fuel of the Boucher reactor will be given by the Russians, given by the Russians already. And Russia has committed itself to give the uh, fuel of uh, Boucher reactor in the coming years. But Iran say, what if they don't? So we must be on the safe side, so we must have enough fuel. OK, fine. But the concern is, if Iran takes 1,200 kilograms of this 3.5% low energy uranium and takes this because it is not uh, under the IA safeguards, then takes this to another facility, the one in Kum, had it not been unearthed, I mean, had it not been sort of uh, declared to the world. And in much smaller time, this 1,200 kilograms of low enriched uranium could be diverted to something like 25 kilograms of high enriched uranium of 90 plus percent, which could be a capacity to one weapon. So concerns about Iran stems from this. Yes, they have, well, undeclared, declared, whatever, all this debate is now left behind. The Director General of the IEA gave all this ultimatum, the EU to intervene, they did just signed the additional protocol, not ratified, etc., etc. But finally, there is this public knowledge everywhere in the world that they have this capacity and they have uh, gener uh, produce low energy uranium. At the face value, this low energy uranium cannot do anything. Well, it could be um, threatening only if it falls into the hands of terrorist organizations. And terrorist organizations, if even you know 3.5 percent or 5 percent low energy uranium, if you explode with uh, high explosives. Of course, it will irradiate, uh, it will disseminate radiation and may kill people not because of the nuclear explosion, not at all. There will be no such nuclear chain reaction with this much enriched uranium, but the, the, the particles that will be spread into the air, into the atmosphere, will uh, sort of emit radiation and which will make people ill, cancer, uh, over, over a period of time. So terrorist organizations, in order to cause panic, might be after even low energy uranium just to explode with high explosives and cause uh, fear to achieve their purpose. And other than that, 3.5 enriched uranium doesn't do anything militarily. Of course, provided that it stays 3.5%. And the concern is because the IAEA cannot go to uh, Iran and inspect everywhere 
and cannot make sure about whether there is or there is not any hidden secret clandestine facility, then the international community cannot be satisfied that whichever produced as low energy uranium will remain as low energy uranium. But if there is another undeclared cum-like uh, enrichment facility, and if Iran takes this to this undeclared facility, then they may produce low energy uranium out of this, this much enough for one weapon. These are the issues that are being discussed in the international arena. And scientists are the ones who make these comments. I mean, I'm not a you know, uh, physicist, nuclear engineer, so I, I may not be making a very definitive comments. But as an industrial engineer, I can understand some of the background discussion here, and I can sort of uh, uh, assess whether what is being discussed by the international community makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. Of course, we, cannot, we are not in a position to blame Iran for doing anything like that. And Iran is not found yet, or as of now, as doing anything wrong like this. But the point here is not that Iran is not found guilty, but the point here is that it, it, this situation that Iran is not being given a clean bill of health. Because the IEA says, I cannot say that they produce weapons, but I cannot say the opposite either, that they do not produce weapons. Because I do not carry out enough inspections. And, because, and I would like, they say, Iran, the IEA says, we would like Iran uh, to have ratified the uh, model pro uh, additional protocol for us to carry out inspections everywhere to take uh, samples from the air, from, from water. Actually, one of the major issues that the IEA is complaining, and you can go to the IEA's uh, uh, website, www.iaea.org, and somewhere on the right-hand side, you will see Iran. And if you click on it, you will see every single uh, IAEA reports, resolutions issued by the IAEA over the last several years, uh, which, um, in a sense, uh, continues to assess the situation. And one of the major concerns of the IAEA authorities is not only the secret facilities that may exist, they say we cannot uh, uh, sort of um, ascertain that there are no other secret facilities. We, we, we're not sure if there is any, uh, any other secret uh, facility. But another thing is they want to talk with the Iranian scientists. There are a number of scientists that the, Iranians, uh, that the IAEA would like to talk about Iran's nuclear activities. And the Iranian authorities in the past allow some of them during this EU3 and uh, Hatemi sort of government. But since Ahmadinejad came to power, all this just uh, are done out of the window. And there is no uh, close cooperation between the IAEA. At least uh, we understand from IAEA's complaints that they are not getting enough cooperation. They say, yes, thank you for this, thank you for that, but these are not enough. And we need more in order to ascertain, to make sure that uh, Iran is not doing anything wrong. And we're not yet at this point. So this is the point. This is the issue which uh, makes uh, the situation all the more difficult. Of course, uh, there are not many options for, uh, for the United States. Yes, they are concerned about Iran being a threat for themselves, for their allies, for Israel, for world security, for whatever reason. But what can they do? As you can see here in this, uh, in this paragraph here, Iran is not Iraq. I mean, Iran is a much bigger country geographically, uh, population-wise, meter-wise, much more powerful, and much more coherent. Because during the uh, Iran, and pr prior to Iran, Iraq, uh, sorry, uh, Iraq war, uh, or the, the war between the United States or US invasion of Iraq, Iraq was, of course, divided de facto into three. No fly zones in the north and south. And in the middle, Saddam Hussein was exerting its power to a certain extent under the sanctions. And prior to war, 
of course, the coalition forces, the United States in particular, collaborated with uh, the, north, uh, the Kurds in the north and the Shia in the south. So they, in a sense, uh, promised them that they would be you know, democratized after Saddam toppled, etc., etc. But Iran, especially when it comes to the nuclear question, nuclear issue, is a very coherent country. I mean, even those in the opposition, may, those who may have complaints about Ahmadinejad or other sort of uh, uh, people who are governing the country, when it comes to the nuclear issue, they want nuclear program to continue, and they don't want the, ex the current uh, administration to step down or just uh, step back or uh, uh, sort of give in to the pressures of the United, St uh, United States and the West. So it is therefore something which is... Uh, quite difficult. So we'll continue with the EU on Tuesday next week. There will be no class on Friday. I will be attending a conference. So on Tuesday next week we'll continue with this issue. And please um, have a look at this PowerPoint and also some of the articles that I've written and also just, you know, there are many websites. For instance, Amelia just mentioned one from Council on Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations. You know this journal, Foreign Affairs, it's one of the leading journals in the international arena, in the international relations discipline, and it's published by the Council on Foreign Relations. And if I'm not mistaken, Davutol has just been awarded something yesterday, uh, the, one of the 100 intellectuals. So it is by the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR.org, CFR.org. And Amelia, just uh, maybe you can ask her, Amelia, you can just send the link to those who, and get Amelia's email, if you like, and just make your own research, because you don't have to be satisfied with everything discussed here, only in three hours a week. You have your readings, you have my website, other websites. For instance, go to the website of ISIS, Uh, and the ISIS website, there are satellite pictures taken from space uh, about uh, you know, some Iranian nuclear facilities and there are a lot of discussion on the technical dimensions of the issue. So anyway, uh, do your own research uh, and by the way, remember that the op-eds are due on December 17th and that simulation due is uh, due on 21st December. And uh, these are all serious assignments that will make up 25% each of your overall grade. And considering your grades coming from midterm, you should be studying hard uh, and make your decision before the final date of uh, withdrawals. All right, uh, I'll see you on Tuesday next week, hopefully.